Welcome everyone to this episode of the Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'm Tim Grady and I'm here with my co-host Lou Weiss and we are going to be talking about a very interesting topic today for those downtown areas that for many years fell into blight as the big box stores built around them and pulled the businesses out of those very eclectic and wonderful downtown areas. Lou is the sponsor of this show through his company, All Metals and Forge Group. You can find them at steelforge.com for industrial uses of forgings, open die, and seamless roll rings. Ilana Pruis, you are founder and CEO of Recast City. And I think what you're doing is absolutely marvelous. Share with our audience what Recast City is doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to join your show. So my name is Ilana Pruce. I have a firm called Recast City. We work with local governments, real estate developers, and economic development authorities to bring small scale manufacturing businesses into those downtowns that you were talking about, but also into our economic investment strategies and our real estate development decision making. Oh, I think it's very exciting. Now, every downtown in every city across the country is looking for a way to revitalize their downtowns. Give us some success stories so they know that this is real and it can really happen. Absolutely. So when we look at what's going on in our downtowns, even before the pandemic, a lot of our smaller cities and towns were really struggling to fill the storefront. Um, traditional retail wasn't really working anymore. The major brands, the national chains were already consolidating how many stores they were having and shrinking their footprint. And so we had a ton of vacancies. And then the pandemic obviously hit all of our lives. And we've had an increase in storefront vacancies because of that. So many businesses had gone out of business during the pandemic. And so one of the things that we do is, is really looking at who gets these storefronts and how are, can we be more creative about putting businesses into storefronts that bring people out, that make people want to be out and, and part of the community, but also are providing better paying jobs in our community and providing more of an opportunity for our local neighbors, our residents to have businesses and be business owners. And that's where small scale manufacturing comes in. These are businesses that produce any kind of tangible product. I'm generally looking at folks that are 50 people or fewer or 20 people or fewer. So there really are micro enterprises in most cases, but they work really well in our storefronts in a lot of cases on Main Street or in downtown or in a neighborhood center. Um, maybe not the, the cut and dye shop and the, the metal grinding, but the consumer facing products, the textile maker, the handbag maker, the jewelry maker, um, the food product shop, the chocolate shop, the, the coffee producer, all of these work really well in our storefronts because they can have a retail component, they can have an open storefront to people walking in, but then people can also walk in and see things being made. And seeing things made is in fact an, an attraction, it draws people out because, I mean, as you guys know, it is so cool to see things being made no matter what it is. Um, it's not just me. I mean, I am the person with my nose up to the window looking at it every time, every chance I get, but every, evidently lots of other people are like that too. And so we can fill these storefronts with businesses that have this retail and production set of elements so that we can fill these storefronts. And the other exciting thing about it, if you think of a coffee roaster as one example, people walk in the front door, they can buy their cup of coffee. In the back, there's a large coffee roasting machine. There's one here in DC called Zeke's. It's laid out exactly like this. There's a coffee roasting machine in the back and out the back door, they ship out their wholesale product for the entire region. And so that one location then has multiple sources of revenue coming into that storefront, which makes that business much more resilient in these times of disaster and unknown of what's going on. And they're helping to fill a vacant storefront in the neighborhood. And on top of that, they're drawing foot traffic to this location, thereby helping fill other storefronts on that block as well. Let me, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> I wanna go back before, before the revitalization of downtown. How did it get to where it was where people were leaving? Uh, people were leaving downtown. I think the number now is 70 some odd percent of the people live in uh, rural area, not in urban area. 
So the town started closing down because the people left. So you don't have much. Oh, road that's traffic. a really complicated question. Right, um, I, I know. Mean, Mine are federal... usually. <laughs> <laughs> so there's um, the vast majority of our country at this point are living in urbanized areas. So that might be a big city, that might be a small city or a small town. Um, our, our country has urbanized for, the, for significantly over the last 50, 60 years. Um, but also 50, 60 years ago, the federal government created um, a mortgage lending program that made it much easier for at least the white population to buy homes and really, in fact, encouraged people to leave cities and buy homes in the suburban areas. And there's a whole bunch of other federal programs that supported it and encouraged it. And so it really pulled people out of the downtowns and then the businesses followed them. On top of that, there's federal policy around commercial construction that, uh, that um, allows the commercial developers to more or less take, take tax credit or tax losses in a different way, depending on sort of where a property is and how it's being built and the sort of the amount of time that you can um, deduct sort of the, the decrease in value of a, of a property, which more or less creates an encouraging proposition for a large big box business to build a space, get the benef tax benefits of it for seven years maybe, and then move to another place, which is why we also have these sort of big box ghost buildings in different parts of the country. And then on top of that, we have local property tax revenues, which are in many cases very dependent on commercial properties. And so you have different communities more or less throwing money or infrastructure investments at these big box, which is why we have um, big box centers, power strips is what they call them sometimes, uh, on our highways and at the edge of town because of the, the, the perception of the property tax benefits around it. Although when you actually look on a per acre basis, our downtowns and our main streets are much, much more valuable on a per acre basis. So when we really think about not only on a per acre property tax benefit basis, but also then a quality of life, um, what people are looking for in a community, investing in our downtowns, it really becomes important. When we had the last recession in 2009, we, after, as we came out of that, we saw a big resurgence in people being interested in moving back downtown, moving back into our small city and, and big city town centers. And so the whole real estate market has really changed in that, you know, sort of 15 year period as well. Well, that was a long, complicated answer. <laughs> you gave me a complicated question. <laughs> well, you rose to the occasion. Thank you. <laughs> Delano, what, um, what towns have experienced this resurgence? And the reason I ask the question, I live in an area called Woodstock, Georgia, and their downtown was in difficult straits. Uh, they did, in fact, revitalize the downtown. It's now one of the hottest real estate areas to be in because the Gen Zers and the Millennials love being in that close quarter downtown. You walk to the, the uh, bar, shop. You know, walk to the restaurant, walk to downtown. It's wonderful. Yeah. What That's have you great. experienced? They're all over the country at this point. Um, there's a, a lot of places that have really figured out, particularly their main street, their core around this. Um, there are a lot of places that haven't. I mean, there's a, particularly when we look at um, you know, the old textile mill towns in North Carolina or South Carolina, a lot of them still haven't figured out how to come back. Um, but Burlington, North Carolina, similarly, has really figured this out. They're investing in the community, investing in storefronts. One of my favorite examples from Burlington, North Carolina, I had nothing to do with it. I just love the example is that the community came together and said, we really need our own brewery as an anchor for our downtown. And so they got 2000 people from town and from the surrounding area to invest and be co-op owners of a locally owned brewery that really is an anchor for downtown. And, and to me, it's just an interesting example about how product businesses are not just about having a business. It's not just about um, having good paying jobs. It's really also in many cases about having a place that people are proud of and, and a place that people can gather in certain ways. We know that there's great research called the soul, soul of the community that looked at small towns in the South and the Midwest. This was a number of years ago. And it looked at why are people feeling, why do people feel tied to a place? And they came up with three different factors and it wasn't economic opportunity. Um, it was that there were places to gather, 
they people felt included in that place and there was some aesthetic beauty the the built environment or the natural environment there was some aesthetic beauty to that place and that that's really what ties people to a place so when we care for our place when we care for our downtown when we care for our neighborhood main streets and we make them beautiful and we create programming so people but not only have a reason to gather but feel included and we create programming that really represents the demographic diversity of our community so everybody feels included there then we're really investing in that quality of place. And lo and behold, when we do invest in the place, we're also doing the best recruitment that we can because we're showing that this is a place that people wanna live. And so people may wanna not only start their business there, but, but move their business there over time. Um, and that downtown becomes a competitive factor at this point in terms of business location. Ilana, you ready for my next I'm ready to go. Dollar question. Yeah. All right. So in 1956, and you sure, certainly were not born then. I was not. I went to a school in Tacoma Park, Maryland, called Tacoma Park Elementary School. It was a wonderful school. It had a, a track. We had a football field. We had everything, but there was no town. Hmm. Is there a town now in Tacoma Park? There's a very lively Main Street in Tacoma Park. Really? Um, it's probably the same buildings. We don't have new, it's a part of the historic district. Um, we don't have any small scale manufacturing on it that I can think of off the top of my head, but we have a very lively um, Main Street that's both on the Maryland, Tacoma Park, for those who don't know, it was right at the border of Maryland and DC. Right. And so our Main Street actually crosses from Maryland to DC. Um, and has some wonderful, wonderful businesses at this point. Um, yes, it's very lively and we have tons of programming, at least when it's not COVID days. So there's a folk festival and there's a street festival and there's all sorts of cultural and music events that happen as well there. So the, the revitalization of certain areas actually can come from literally nothing and turn into a revitalized growth area like to yeah. Cover Park. Yeah, usually it's because that there, there's an existing set of buildings that were there, but maybe they were, they're empty, they've been neglected for a long period of time. Um, the buildings in downtown Tacoma Park, they're historic, they were there. My guess is in 1956, they were vacant, um, although I don't know that for a fact, I'm taking a guess. So um, some of them might be newer, um, you know, some of them are old houses that got, you know, a frontage that was more of a commercial frontage. Right. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity to look at uh, a place that has a historic main street that maybe is really on hard times. One of the things that I really love about small scale manufacturing businesses as part of the solution is this concept that they can, they do sell online, they do sell wholesale. They're not dependent on just who's gonna walk in that door tomorrow, like traditional retail or a restaurant or bar is going to be. And so they're quite literally bringing revenues into the community because they can sell regionally, nationally, or even internationally as part of their business, just like any other manufacturing business. And so at the same time, they're fitting into the fabric of a place. And so they're creating multiple benefits all at the same time by being there, filling that space, bringing revenues into the community, by my estimation, the small scale manufacturing nationally is paying 50 to 100% more in wages um, than retail or service jobs. So this is also a way that we're creating better paying jobs within our communities, which we know is a huge gap in our country, the lack of middle income jobs. And it's drawing people there. It's, it's creating this energy in a place that maybe didn't have it before and can be the catalyst that helps then bring the restaurant or the bar or the retail there as well. What percent of uh, the funding, because you mentioned earlier about private funding, which I think was a very patriotic thing for those people to do, um, but what percent of the general funding is either a state, county, community, or maybe even federal funding to revitalize the downtowns? It's generally a mix. Um, it takes private sector developers uh, to be a part of it. Some communities have a community development corporation, which is a nonprofit entity that can either um, do the development themselves or partner with developers um, and bring some public funding to it that way. There are federal programs that will help 
uh, provide loans. So for instance, there's a federal, the US Economic Development Administration has something called the Revolving Loan Fund Program. The revolving loan funds are in 800 different places across the country. Those funds can be used for a small business, including small scale manufacturing, to buy their own real estate. And so part of what we look at in this renovation or revitalization is, are there legacy owners that have filled the space with something over time that maybe are open to a different use? Are there new property owners or businesses that want to become property owners? And, and how do we help them fund? There's a number of federal programs like new market tax credits or historic preservation tax credits that can help with that. Um, but ultimately, the numbers have to work like anything in business, right? The numbers have to work for that, that funding to, to come together around a property. So the role of uh, your company, Re Recast City, LLC, you're acting as a consultant, uh, a, a overseer of these projects. Um, explain that a little bit. So we work with communities and with real estate developers who want to bring small scale manufacturing into the mix. They might they want to focus on a specific property. They might want to focus on their downtown or their broader economic development strategy, but they know that small scale manufacturing or they understand that small scale manufacturing can make a difference in what they're trying to achieve. And we work with communities to help them achieve those outcomes that they see. Part of that is by finding the small scale manufacturers in their community, understanding what their needs are, working with property owners, figuring out this real estate, small business support, capital investment trifecta that is really important to making the pieces come together in the end. Um, and all of the details about how to do it is all in my new book, Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. Um, and um, it, it's really all of our work. It's a how to. It, it is really the sort of the best of DIY. Um, my goal with the book is to really hand over the tools to every community leader who says, yes, this sector might be important to us. Let me figure out what this might mean for us. Um, and then we also help people figure out all of the models. There's, there's so much of this going on in different parts of the country that when you're looking for how to, is, has someone ever done whatever it is, changed their zoning code, invested in a commercial shared kitchen, um, partnered with a developer to, you know, sub master lease a space so you can incubate small scale manufacturers into storefronts. All of these different things are happening all over the country already. And so a lot of times it's helping local leaders understand it's being done somewhere. So it's okay for you to do it too. So are you doing this all over the country or are you basically in the DC, Virginia, Maryland area? No, we work nationally. We work all over the country. Very nice. Very nice. Alana, I'd like you to hold up your book again for a moment. And I want to point out to our viewers and listeners that in the description below this podcast will be a link to the book. So very nice. <laughs> a link to the book so that you can get a copy of Recast Your City. Thanks, Alana. I appreciate you holding up the book so they can really know when they get there, they're at the right book. And it matches and you guys with the yellow, which I love. Hey, that worked out really well when we talked about it, didn't it? <laughs> Uh, you might want to get, <laughs> you finally got it, huh? <laughs> you might want to give us your URL for your website so our listeners can, as uh, soon as the show is over, they can go run and do that. Absolutely. So uh, listeners are welcome to even get the first chapter for free at the book website, which is recastyourcity.com. And if you're interested in the work that Recast City does with communities, that is recastcity.com. We're very easy to remember. It's all the same thing. So um, yeah, so the, the book has all sorts of materials and worksheets that you can get, that you can download. It really is a hands-on kind of tool. Well, that, that's, what? Great. that's great. Glad to hear somebody's doing this because our city's uh, been in poor shape for quite a while. It's exciting well, to see some of those redevelopments take place. That downtown area of Woodstock, I've been here 16 years now, was in a tired state when I arrived. And to see its evolution 
into what it's been recast as is fascinating uh, and, and very successful, by the way. Yes, no, it's it's really exciting to see what some communities have managed. It's also really hard to watch other places continue to struggle and not have the political support or have the pieces really to pull together to make it happen. But most communities, I would say, are, are maybe five years away from having a lot of energy in their downtown. It's really about taking the steps to get there and, and really looking at the kinds of businesses that can fill these spaces in the short term, even while you're working on the, the bigger, harder stuff. And I think right now we're in this really transformational time um, where so much federal funding has gone out to our communities um, through the American Rescue Plan Act and all the funding that went down to our local jurisdictions through that, that there is an opportunity to do something really different and to invest in not only the spaces for locally owned businesses, particularly small scale manufacturing that can bring funding into the community, but also into the business development support that a lot of these businesses need as well. I have one last question before Tim wraps this up. Does Tacoma Park Elementary School still exist on Piney <laughs> Branch Road? Tacoma Park Elementary, Elementary School. It's not on Piney Branch Road anymore. It is on Maple Avenue. I'm lost. I don't know where that is. Um, <laughs> it was a beautiful school in Montgomery. Montgomery County High School was nearby as well. So the school on Piney Branch is now the middle school. It's Tacoma Park Middle School. That's the one on Piney Branch. It's enormous. And then Montgomery Blair High School, which right, might be the one you're talking to, is where one of my kids goes. Ah. But in a completely different location from even when I was a kid around here, because I also grew up around here. I, I loved living there at the time. It's a great place. Tim? No doubt. Uh, Ilana, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you sharing all about recast your city and we encourage people to go to recastyourcity.com for the book or recast what was your recastcity.com for you thanks That's for joining it. us thank you so much thanks for joining us today and for all of you who are listening to this please read the description down below find the link to the book and as always, we appreciate you visiting jacketmediaco.com where you'll find all of our other podcasts, including a link to this one. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. Thank you.